Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. This is a Viking Type H sword from Rob Miller at Castle Keep Forge. And a couple quick disclaimers before I get into it. First and foremost, this is a secondhand sword, which means it may not be representative of what you would get if you were to buy one new from Mr. Miller at Castle Keep Forge. I believe it's about a thousand pounds, uh, and so I think that's a billion dollars in U.S. currency. I'm not exactly sure at the moment. Probably should have checked before making the review, but it changes day to day. Anyway, uh, the secondhand nature means that it is. Uh, well, more than that. It's not just secondhand, it's used. The previous owner noted that he cut with it. It shows signs of cutting, and some of the things that I'm going to harp on on this sword could be largely due to the fact that it is a used variety of that sword. Now, I don't think it was used extensively, but, you know, perhaps it had a larger impact than I understand as I'm, as I'm reviewing it. So now you know before you hear me say other stuff. Uh, the other bit you should know is that uh, I don't know a lot about Viking swords. It's a type that I don't generally review, and the reason for that is I don't generally like Viking swords uh, because they, I find them to be relatively uncomfortable to grip. Uh, that is purely my error, not, not the swords. I, I would imagine the warriors of old, which I understand uh, did not have necessarily hand sizes much, much bigger or smaller than today's average person. Um, probably knew something I didn't because I wouldn't imagine they would bring a wildly uncomfortable thing into battle with them. And so they probably knew something about swinging it around that I that I just don't. But for me, no matter which Viking sword I hold, none of them just feel particularly comfortable. And this one, as I understand, is relatively proportional in terms of the size of, of grip that's made. And whether even if they're extended, they just generally don't feel particularly good. So suffice to say, I'm not a fanboy uh, of, of the sword. And so you should, I think, know all that context going in. I'm not an expert, not a fan necessarily. And even though this is one of the more comfortable varieties I've I've held it, it it's it's still a viking sword and therefore it's it's really that it feels the least bad of them than than good in particular at least in my eyes so with that context in mind hopefully uh, you you have the right <laughs> the, the right uh, lens with which to view my commentary and I will just get on with it and hopefully show you something interesting or useful about the sword and I'm going to start with the pommel right here so the first bit to know about the pommel is it is peened right here. Now, as I understand, Viking swords are usually made in, in two pieces. I don't know that that's always the case, but generally speaking, I see a first section of the pommel here, which is then uh, peened on very often, similar to the way you often see European-style swords. Um, but the first section is, is peened on like, a, a, like any other pommel, like this pommel, in fact. And then there's a second section, which this one has an artistic embellishment right here, this groove that's cut in. And the second section is riveted on in such a way that it holds the peen on. Now, I don't know exactly the, the benefits of doing a, a, a pommel in this particular way, though I'd imagine there, there was some, some particular benefit. I just don't happen to know what it is. Uh, this one, however, is not made in that fashion. This appears to be one piece of metal that is formed with dimension and taper. And I happen to really Really like the way it is and as far as Viking swords go it's one of the most well the, the least bad in terms of feeling to me personally in terms of holding it uh, I do like that there's some dimension here and some of it is very subtle so there's a slight ridge that runs about three quarters of the way up this first section here before the groove there's a gentle ridge that tapers around around the blade uh, it, uh, it also has kind of an elliptical shape to it there's little points on either side and it tapers off to this dome with a peen that is finished without a lot of hammer marks or banging or, or things that make it look bad. And one interesting note about this pommel that I find is that as you can see the grip right here, uh, one side is, is more elaborately finished than the other and that would suggest to me that the sword is probably meant to be held on your, your belt on the left side and taken out with your right hand and uh, and likely held this way. So if I hold the sword this way, which again I've, I've kind of espoused my, my thoughts on Viking swords comfort um, but as I hold it this way, and maybe I'm holding it wrong, but no matter which way I hold it, this little nubbin digs into the flub of my hand. And this little nubbin is sharper than this little nubbin. So one side has a slightly pointier side to it than the other, and it digs in, as, as you might expect, uh, more or less. So it, it just tells me that the sword wants to be held in a particular way. And so the, the flub of my hand uh, feels less hurty on this side uh, than it does if I hold it on the reverse on this side. And it's not exactly sharp. It doesn't bite into me in such a way that it draws blood or anything, but it just has a little bit more tooth in it, so to speak, uh, that digs into my hand. Anyway. As we move on here, this, this groove is cut in, and I notice that it's not rusting, but it's got some schmutz in it or something. It's, it's tough to get oil into, tough to clean a little bit. Uh, but the transitions here as we go up to the grip here, uh, they're not perfect. They're not great, right? These are obviously like uh, 
um, kind of separately made handle. They're not scales, but you know the, the grip material is made separately. And the transition isn't bad. It's tampered in such a way that it's comfortable. And as I swung it around, that was not the part I noticed in terms of discomfort. I certainly noticed these little nubbins digging into my hand and, and kind of rubbing against the, the flub of my hand more than anything else. Uh, but these transitions were not uncomfortable. It's just worth noting that they're there. Whether or not they're supposed to be, I don't know. But this looks like an attempt to make a kind of a seamless transition. And, and if that's the case, then it was missed slightly. Um, this side has a slightly larger transition than this one. The front face has a flatter transition. The back face has, I don't know, a couple millimeters along, along the ledge. Anyway, there we go on the, the pommel side of things. As it is, I think it's, it's certainly handsome looking. And it actually goes to this guard that is overall, I think, an incredibly handsome looking guard. I, I like the kind of uh, two-piece little bits on either end. I don't know exactly what this black material is. Obviously, this is stained wood, but I don't know if this is horn or, or some other kind of darkened wood or other, other material. Uh, they are made in two pieces on the script section here. I can tell because one, this piece is solid and doesn't move. Then we have the center ring, which is solid and doesn't move. But this top scale, or not scale, but top part of the handle uh, moves around like it's, you know, some of the glue has come loose or something and it, it's rattling, which you might be able to hear in the microphone. So uh, as it is, though, that is really my my only complaint that is more objective <laughs> and not based on my, my, my somewhat uh, disdain for the feel of Viking swords in my hand, this, this movement of the top part right here appears that it, the handle isn't formed in such a way that it's maintained the same level of tightness all the way around. And I don't know how to fix it either because there's not exactly large gaps for me to put any kind of adhesive or something, something in. So fixing this would be a little bit of a challenge. And I haven't really tested how durable it is or how much it's it's going to move around, but I do feel it as I move my, my hand around. As I move the sword in my grip, I do feel it move slightly, but with not so much movement that it, it gives me any concern about swinging it around. It doesn't feel like it's going to instantly crack in half or be problematic, though I suppose when it does, it'll, it'll actually be easier to fix at that point. Uh, anyway, uh, we have a center ring right here, which is more elaborate on the face of it than it is on the rear, what I'm assuming is the rear. And this doesn't look like it's kind of where it was welded or something like that. This this looks more intentional, like it's the piece that's made to go along your belt. Uh, it could be just that it was easier to, to kind of solder this ring or something like that here, but I, I'm guessing that this is a cast piece and not carved out. Uh, so anyway, there we go. We have, we have the the front face looking a little bit more elaborate than likely the back. Uh, along with that, I do want to kind of throw some props here that this wood piece has held up pretty well in terms of usage. So I've held it a lot. It's been through various climate changes, various uh, various temperatures, various zones with humidity changes and such. And overall, it's, it's held up really well. I mean, obviously, we've got some wiggle here, but uh, I've held it with rings and in my bare hand, and it's gotten wet and all that kind of stuff. And really, uh, it, it hasn't degraded in terms of appearance. It still looks it still looks really, really good, really handsome in terms of the overall execution of, of the grip and the wood and the quality of materials used. Just missing a bit of adhesive here. Uh, what I would note in terms of flaws is along some of the woods, especially where it goes into the ring, I see tool markings, some file markings and things like that. And I don't think that those are the result of being secondhand either. It just looks like it wasn't sanded down perhaps as much as it could have been in some spots. And so I'm seeing some of those file markings. And I do also notice some imperfections in the casting quality here, some spots where whatever maybe a uh, darkening agent they've used, uh, you know, if it's a, a sulfur that was used to to blacken the inside here, uh, it's blotchy in some spots, and I, and I spot some tool markings, some file markings, and some of the woodwork that's been stained over. And so, again, when you're, when you're spending like over $1,000 on a sword, which this one likely is because of the conversion rate, uh, that... And maybe this one is even more expensive or less expensive. I don't know. I, I see that the price of the Viking sword is roughly a thousand pounds, but maybe this variety is, is more or less in this configuration. Um, but still, I think a lot of people have really high expectations in that in that realm. So the wiggly grip right here might be problematic, but seeing these kind of unfinished marks here uh, is is another thing. It it I don't know if that bothers you or not. Does it add a sense of kind of handmade craftsmanship to it, or uh, does it does it seem like just something the the craftsman should have uh, addressed prior to? sending it off and, and calling it done. And there's a lot of little things on here like that that are, are I don't know, a, a, you know, go to the handmade feel of this sword. Now, some people are going to kind of poo-poo that and say that, you know, those are details that should be, everything should be perfectly symmetrical at that price and it should be pristine and uniform and no, 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 no. But um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. It started right at this pommel with one side being marginally sharper than the other. We've got some file marks and things like that in here. Uh, but just the waviness of the line, there's little subtle things in here that I'll continue to mention that just, you can kind of tell that there's there's some 
<laughs> certain handmadeness that goes into this sword. Anyway, uh, the grip itself, I think I've exhausted what I can say about the aesthetics. In terms of feel, again, I can't I can't say that anything is, is necessarily bad if you like Viking swords. There's no there's sharp ledges in the aesthetic of this little jewel in the center here, this little jewelry bit. Um, but none of it bites me, none of it hurts, and all the Viking swords rub on the flub of my hand and feel uncomfortable in this one. certainly feels the least bad. So if you're looking for a Viking sword out of the many that I've held, granted this is one of the few that I've gotten to spend a lot of time with, uh, but that's... That was, again, by choice because this one looked like and certainly felt like it hurt less than some of the other Viking swords that I've had. Um, anyway, this this section here is is not uncomfortable to grip. It certainly rests in your hands. Uh, it, it might seem awkward and weird to kind of hold on to, but I'm not bothered by this tapered section in the blade at all. In terms of like indexing, it fits well and rests in, in a way that I, I guess I, I found more comfortable than I thought it would be. I thought this taper would would feel really stupid and weird. And nope, the, the only thing that continues to be problematic is these nubbins rubbing in my hand. Anyway, uh, if you see kind of more conventionally uh, made grips that have kind of the, the more conventional, stereotypical European style, style leather bound grip, uh, don't be dissuaded by, by this particular thing. If you can get over this you know, sticking into the flub of your hands. This bit right here is actually uh, pretty easy to index, pretty comfortable in the hand, and I think actually feels overall uh, pretty secure and actually adds adds a bit to the feature then rather than detracts. Anyway, uh, the next bit I will talk about is this cross guard here. Um, I do notice that some of these ledges, like this one right here, are sharp enough that it, again, digs into the flub of my hand, and my hand is really forced to, to lock in to this area here, and you can kind of see the, the fatness rolling over onto, <laughs> onto the cross guard, and it doesn't feel comfortable. It, it certainly rides in, into my skin a little bit. It's not sharp. It's rounded down in such a way that it's, it's not meant to dig in too much, but I have a feeling that if I really gave a forceful blow and it, it had any amount of reverberation or, or vibration, that it would it would feel really uncomfortable in my hand pretty quickly if I wasn't using a glove. Uh, as it is, though, the shape is pretty uniform. It's got, again, a nice central, uh, central ridge here, and it's kind of subtly done. It matches the pommel really, really well. It has some depth and dimension. It swells. It has uh, kind of corners that are finished up, but they're not exactly symmetrical. So one has, you know, slightly different angle grinds on it. Overall, it's pretty smooth, but there's just something asymmetrical about it to my eye. And, and it, again, some people are going to attribute that adding to the handmade feel of the sword. Other people are going to are going to not like that very much. Anyway, as it is, I think the overall hilt construction is very, very handsome. I like the kind of simple, elegant look to it with a little bit of zazz, but not, not too much. Anyway, to me, aesthetically, this is very pretty. Hopefully, what I've added in terms of my fat hand trying to hold it has, has added some, some value. As we go to the grip and the cross guard, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. It, it, as far as custom varieties go, it's it's all right, but there is certainly a noticeable gap in the cross guard around the blade, and it looks like there's some attempt to have the the sword in one side rest in the the fuller area section here, and the other it misses the mark a little bit, and you can kind of make out some tooling marks and things like that there as well. Uh, it's not as as well done as I might like to see in a sword of this price point, but it's certainly better than I've come to expect with a lot of swords. Even in the custom variety, this is often something that's missed and not, well, I don't know if it's a miss or if it's just something that takes a lot of work that most people don't care about. And if we're comparing it to historic blades, you know, there, there's plenty with a lot of uh, gap in the grip and rehilts and things like that. It's, it's something that I tend to harp on more than most, I think. But anyway, something that uh, other people tend to harp on as well, or at least care about. If you do, now I guess you've seen it. But it's not as though it's problematic or, or anything other than a cosmetic thing that ha doesn't have a whole lot of bearing and historical significance. So uh, I'm going to stop talking about the cross guard and hilt in general and move on to the sword itself. And uh, the Viking Type H, as I understand it, is more about the blade than the hilt, and I could be wrong on that, but this one has a very, very, very wide pronounced fuller that runs most of the way, about three quarters of the way, up the blade. And so then it terminates in this kind of relatively wide kind of swath section here, and this spot where the fuller terminates is actually the thickest part of the blade. So it has some distal taper that runs, but it actually, when this fuller finishes off, it swells in such a way that this point is actually the thickest bit on the blade, and then it tapers down and, uh, and rounds off and has some, some taper to it in, in this plane, this distal taper, as we call it. So there is some taper to the blade, but not, not, necessarily, a whole, not necessarily a whole lot, which, as I understand it, is uh, the way this, this typology is intended to be made. Uh, one thing I noticed as an odd bit about it, though, these 
bevels right here. So as it runs off the fuller and goes down one, it's a single bevel um, and it's not particularly sharp. <laughs> it's very, really quite dull. Uh, even the original section down here that I, I believe is probably the, the closest to the original edge that is remaining on this blade is, is not really very sharp at all. But there are, there's about a, a millimeter, millimeter and a half of difference between some of these bevels. So if I turn the sword around, one section has a pretty wide bevel here and it it's doesn't quite match. And as I flip it around, uh, they're, they're just different sizes. And so that, that runs along the, the surface of the blade. You don't notice it necessarily at, at a glance, but once you see it, you can kind of spot that these bevels are a little different in size. And it's not that the sword uh, curves around or, or has a, a poorly made edge. Uh, it's just that some of the bevels are, are different thicknesses than, than others. Uh, the other bit I note is that in the fuller, there's a lot of surface rippling and the, the edges wander a little bit, you know, not, not a significant amount, but they certainly do wander. And again, um, I believe Mr. Miller is probably doing some hand sanding on this. I would not be capable of getting lines as good as this, but um, I'm not a swordsmith. <laughs> and so it is worth noting that if you're expecting pristineness, where you look down and see a sharp, crisp line running the entire length of the fuller, I do spot some wiggling. I do spot some surface rippling and things like that. Um, the edge as well is not sharp at all, and I feel some little dings and stuff in here, some spots where it appears to be, you know, I don't know, to have to have a little wiggle to it. Um, but I don't know if that is the nature of being secondhand and having been used or not. I see that it's been cut with. I was thinking about sharpening it, but I'm, I'm hesitant because this is a relatively expensive sword with a relatively nice shiny polish on it. It'd be really easy for me to screw it up, so I haven't done that. I did make some attempt at cutting, but naturally with a sword that I'm not comfortable holding, that I don't really want to swing very hard uh, and a dull edge, it, it, the result was unimpressive to say the least. Uh, so it didn't cut through water bottles particularly well, <laughs> and I, to its credit, as I smashed it into the water bottles and felt the vibration in my hand, it did uh, whack this pommel into my hand in an uncomfortable way, no matter which way I held it. Um, but it did actually kind of cut into the pool noodle slightly, which I'm, I'm kind of surprised about, given that this is a very, very dull sword that I can press pretty hard with my finger and run it on the edge here, and it doesn't cut in. And I'm, you know, running that into a pool noodle in it, and it cuts in just a little bit. So geometry-wise, I'm guessing that this single bevel that's on here would lend itself to taking an edge really well, to, to doing a better job cutting than I'm, I'm certainly capable of doing, because this isn't a sharp sword, but if it was, I, I bet it would be... I bet it would be a very capable cutter. I like the appearance of the wide fuller. I like the way it looks. This sword as well has some edge damage right at the very tip here. There's some kind of uh, bending on the edge and stuff, but I did kind of place it on a log and it actually, to take some photos of it actually, and it cut right into the log and didn't take any any damage and seemed to penetrate into the wood pretty well, even though, even though it was damaged. The other bit that I want to note about the blade, because I don't have a whole lot to contribute <laughs> in terms of uh, sharpness and cutting and things like that, is that it's got about an eight inch point of balance. It's pretty far up the up the blade here. And this is a two pound, seven ounce blade, which for a single handed arming sword isn't uncharacteristic. But with a 32 inch blade and an eight, eight, you know, an eight inch point of balance, it just feels really hefty in the hand. Some Viking swords have felt that way. I don't know if that's characteristic of the type H or not, but it does not feel good. And that's <laughs> certainly, it's more than that just because of the grip. It, it wants to chop. It wants to, it wants to, it feels very, not axy, not dead, but I, I definitely, this definitely is, is a bit more cumbersome to move than I'm comfortable with, especially given this grip wanting to run into the fat of my hand routinely. It's just, it's, I have to intentionally try to stop it. And the way I do that is with pain. So, uh, Another, another certainly bit to know. And I don't know the point of balance or what would be expected from these swords, historically speaking, but uh, eight inches up is, is certainly lends itself to feeling tip heavy to, to most people. I tried other grips, incidentally, and things like that, and all of them uh, really, <laughs> really made it almost worse. Um, you know, if I hold the pommel in kind of a pistol grip kind of thing, which I've, I've seen some people uh, note may, may have been something that was done, uh, it feels feels like it wants to slip out of my hand and it doesn't, it feels even less safe. Like at least this way, I'm not going to let go of the thing. It's not going to turn into a helicopter of death. If I try not to break my grip and move it, it doesn't, you know, it wants to lurch forward out of my hand. So it's, it's a tricky one to do. The other, uh, 
bit to know about just kind of care that I've noticed is that this is really hard to keep clean. This mirror polish that Mr. Miller puts on it is, is very nice. I like the look of it. It's very handsome, especially as I compare it to some of the more satin finished blades up on the wall. But it, it shows that rust really quickly and it rust just gravitates to this thing. I have had to clean it and be very diligent about it. The previous owner had some rust speckles on it and it's, it's been clean, but there's certainly remnants of those rust speckles on the surface of this polish. And it would really need, uh, you know, to, to have a, a layer taken off to get all of the, all of the remnants of and the stains that happen from those rust stains uh, completely removed. As it is, it's, it's certainly fine and, and definitely handsome looking, but it is, it is challenging to keep clean because this, this one uh, attracts rust, I think, more than anything. Also because I, I don't have a scabbard for it, so I keep it out in the open. But that's, that's about it. There we go. It rusts really easy. It's hard to handle. <laughs> it's got a high point of balance and feels rough. Um, but it's still a very handsome and beautiful sword. And it's something that I'm not capable of making. So I don't want to intend this as a dig on Mr. Miller. This may also be a relatively old piece. And I don't know if it's either the second hand nature or the fact that maybe it's a little bit older in years. Uh, Mr. Miller may be making pieces that are above this in terms of caliber at this point. Because some of the photos that I've seen on his website and some of, the, some of the feedback that I've heard from other people that have had his wares is, generally speaking, overly positive. So uh, anyway, that's really all I got. Hopefully it's been somewhat interesting. I'll put links to the specifications for this sword and weapon dynamics and all that kind of crap in the description down below. If you have any questions, uh, throw them in the commentary and I'll do my best to answer them. Anyway, that is truly all I have. Hopefully it's been an interesting video. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.